a sight few of us have ever seen, the breaching of the southern right whale. Hunted for centuries, now almost extinct, is one of the rarest mammals on Earth. The few that do remain breed here, off the Valdez Peninsula, down near the toe of South America. And here too comes a multitude of seabirds and marine mammals. Sea lions, elephant seals, penguins, cormorants and a host of others, attracted by the meeting point of two vast ocean currents, a natural signpost that also guided this tiny expedition over 5,000 miles to film the most fantastic breeding grounds on Earth. The expedition consisted of Andres and Maria Isabel Pruna and Krav and Anne Menuhin. For these four young people, this was the fulfillment of a dream. They believed that a film record of this wonderful place would be a unique document and risked everything they had to mount the expedition. Eight hundred miles south of Buenos Aires, twelve hundred miles north of the Antarctic, the Valdez Peninsula stretches like a hammerhead across the sea. Just offshore at the confluence of the great Falkland and Brazil currents is a rich supply of food. One reason for the peninsula's popularity as a breeding ground. Other reasons are the good beaches, ground soft enough for penguins to burrow, sheltered lagoons, the only sheltered water north of the Straits of Magellan the perfect breeding ground, and used by so many different species. Pockmarked with the burrows of a huge colony of Magellanic penguins, the ground, like a lunar landscape, lies silent and deserted. But what a change is coming. In a week or two, this strip of wild wasteland will be a scene of frantic activity, the air filled with raucous sound. The penguins come from the warm Brazilian waters, over 2,000 miles away. Half their lives are spent at sea, where they find their food. The other half is spent mainly on land, where they have to come to breed or to molt. And here on the Valdez Peninsula is their breeding ground. Soon, what's now an empty wilderness will be alive with a million penguins. This solitary bird is the very first arrival. And now in the southern spring, which is autumn in the northern hemisphere, countless other birds begin to arrive on these communal breeding grounds. From far distant waters come three species of cormorants, rock cormorant, guane cormorant and king cormorant. When the sea lions arrive, it's the males that come ashore first. Eight feet from nose to tail, each weighing a quarter of a ton, these great mammals come in through the surf after their long journey to claim their own special areas of beach. The breeding territories they must establish before they can receive their harem of females, usually about nine apiece. Here a new arrival challenges the territorial rights of an established owner and is quickly dealt with. The defeated intruder retreats along the shore to try his luck elsewhere. When the fighting has died down and the male sea lions have established their territories, the females start to come ashore. And they will try to return to the same spots on the beach and to the same hurry that they were in the year before. This female is searching for a particular place on the beach. First of all, she has a good look round. Then she starts to sniff the sand. Then another look round. She finds herself between two different harems and seems undecided which to choose. 
Eventually, she goes across and inspects one group, sniffing the male in charge. Not satisfied, she turns away and goes to the other group and sniffs at that male. And now she's found him. After a journey of thousands of miles, this is the place. More and more penguins are coming ashore, a mass migration of hundreds of thousands, most of which arrive in their breeding colony within a space of only two or three days. The birds landing now are the breeders. The young, sexually immature birds arrive much later, merely to moat. Day and night the migration continues, a constant stream of penguins hurrying to find and claim the very same nesting burrows they used the year before. Exposed at low tide are miles of level sands which at high tide are the breeding grounds of the southern right whale. Here the whales mate and give birth and sometimes die as Craven and Menuhin found when they went out to explore. This is vertebrae. There are either two whales here, or it could be part of that head, Annie. It could be part of that head and the backbone down there, which means there's either two or perhaps three whales here. Yeah. Let's get this backbone. Look at this huge beast. No, I, I think it's a vertebrate, huh? Why don't we try and lift it out now? Whoa! That's a vertebrate! It's bigger than I am! Put it over here on top of this other vertebrate. It's been bleached by the sun. And we'll put a whole whale together, upside down. It's got to weigh more than you and I can find. Here. Here we go. Now, if we stack that up about 60 feet, we'll have a whole whale. In fact, I think there's more here. Well, this is a rib. Well, it's a good guess. Yes, that's a piece of the backbone. This would be a rib coming off of it. These vertebrae and the other bones are probably not more than four or five years old. But not far away, there are signs that trace the history of this coastline over millions of years. Here in the cliffs, close to the whale's breeding ground, is evidence that ages ago, the sea level was 50 feet higher than it is today. These fossilized Patagonian oysters are at least 25 million years old. Other fossil remains show that the southern right whales were inhabiting these shores at the same time as the oysters. And so were many of the other animals we've seen, although some of them were very different in size. 25 million years ago, the penguins were five feet high, almost as tall as a man. But the sea lions and the elephant seals, which evolved from small bear-like and otter-like creatures, were much the same size as they are now. The elephant seals arrive early in the season. The males, monsters of up to four or five tons, 20 feet in length, secure mating territories as soon as the females are given birth. They get their name from their strange trunk-like noses. The first pups are usually born less than a week after a female has come ashore. Like all seals, owing to the structure of a female's organs, successful mating can take place almost immediately after she's given birth. At high tide, only a stone's throw from the elephant seal's breeding grounds, on the sands we've already seen, is a breeding place of the southern right whales. No one knows why they flap their tails like this. Tail lobbing, it was called by the old whalers. In these shallow waters we see something never before filmed, a young southern right whale that is pure white, 
For the Menuhins, it was a great moment. We had heard the year before that there was a white whale in the area. We didn't know whether these whales came back, migrated back to the same places. We didn't really know whether it was going to be a perfectly white whale or a sort of off-color gray. But when we saw it, it was just so distinctive. It was just pure pearl white. And I think there's probably a good case in saying that it's the only one in the world. It's absolutely unique. It was interesting to see that the calf was not at all rejected by the mother. It was at least two years old, possibly three. And the, the gentleness that the mother was showing, it, the way they played together, it was really lovely. For a time during their eight-month expedition, the Menuhins and the Pruners pitched their camp right in the middle of a penguin colony. It was a fine opportunity to observe the behavior of a species that few scientists have ever studied. At first, they were very, very wary and a bit shy. We couldn't really get too close to them. We didn't try and push it. We kept to ourselves and sort of didn't pay attention to them. And it wasn't very long until they uh, sort of took it upon themselves to come and visit us. And they loved the tents. They'd hide underneath them to get some shade. And then the worst part is they started to dig underneath them. They were trying to make a burrow. The courtship of these birds is quite delightful to watch. It all takes place as soon as they've established themselves in their burrows. This quaint head posturing with the bird craning forward and peering upwards from side to side. And this clapping of bills together. They're both part of the courtship ritual preparatory to mating. During copulation, the male penguin's wing movements and the rubbing of his bill against the female's bill both stimulates and positions the female. Not all the burrows have pairs, and the few single males remaining advertise for a mate. <laughs> For 
the cormorants, nest building is easy. You simply steal material from your neighbor. One would come back with his mouth absolutely full of seaweed, deposit it in his nest, and it would only be a few minutes before birds all around him would be stealing from him to line their own nests. It was really a miracle that anything ever got done. We were very, very surprised. In fact, we were quite unprepared for the fighting amongst the mega Yannick penguins that we saw. Most female penguins lay two large white eggs. The first is laid two days after mating, the second four days later. Both will hatch at the same time. No one knows how long they take to incubate, but it's thought to be about 45 days. Out on the beaches, the breeding season has started for the sea lions. We saw two sea lion births and it really was exciting. The one that was particularly interesting, the pup was born with the sac completed around it. And it was fascinating to watch the gentleness and tenderness of the mother and she reached down, opened the sac, which I didn't realize the animals would do instinctively. She sniffed the breath, of course, to identify the pup. That would be her identification throughout the stay there. And seemed so thrilled about it herself. It was as if she'd known she'd really had quite an accomplishment. We also saw an elephant seal breech birth, which at first it didn't dawn on us quite what was happening, but the flippers were coming out, and the poor thing was born dead. The interesting part is that the mother made no instinctive reaction to it at all. I think she must have known it was dead. She didn't lean back to sniff it. She didn't give any cries of success, which very often they do. She just lay there very dejected and as if it had been a wasted effort. As in every breeding ground, mortalities are inevitable, but nothing that is eatable can be said to be wasted. Everything is cleared up by the scavengers. Even the placenta from a sea lion's birth is fought for by a host of hungry gulls and petrels. A valuable service, since it keeps the beaches clean.
Predation, too, plays a useful part in keeping the numbers of certain species within reasonable limits. Predators abound, such as the kelp gull, dolphin gull, skewer, giant fulmo, and the Dominican gull we see here, a renowned chicken egg stealer. In the penguin colony, many eggs and young birds are taken by predators. And this annual loss on the breeding grounds is probably very necessary to avoid a too rapidly expanding population. Eggs in unguarded nests are very vulnerable to predators, such as these skewers, driven off too late by the returning nest owner. It seems that occasionally, by pecking at the eggshell, a parent will help the chick to hatch out. This is very unusual bird behaviour, but here we can see it happening. We saw one hatching where the mother pecked the first hole in the shell and uh, actually breached the shell and it was right exactly where the chick's beak was. And uh, from that point on, the chick, by moving about, stretching, movements of its wings and feet, head, begins to break the shell. The quickly growing young penguins are fed by each parent in turn. Very little is known to science about these birds, but seemingly the young penguins stimulate the parent to regurgitate food by pecking at the base of the parent's bill. Their staple diet consists of squid and fish about the size of a sardine like the anchovy. And there's a plentiful supply of food. There needs to be, with millions of birds depending on it, Using their echolocation, dolphins track down tremendous shoals of anchovies when they come close in shore. Vast clouds of seabirds are attracted by the movement of the dolphins, and this in turn leads to bouts of frenzied feeding. We were very lucky once. We saw a large flight of terns leave the rookery and head out to sea. We followed them and arrived at this vast school of anchovy just about the same time they did. In the 25 years that I've, I've lived on by or near the sea, it was the most visually electrifying experience that I've ever had. To watch these dolphins tear into these schools of anchovy, the water just littered, sparkling with fish scales, pieces of anchovy, the birds diving, totally unafraid, totally unaware of our presence.
The elephant seal pups that were born almost as soon as their mothers arrived on the beach have gained over 200 pounds during the last three weeks. An amazing weight increase due to the richest mother's milk in the world. Even at this stage, the pups still can't swim. They bask in the sun and scratch themselves, living partly on their own stores of fat until they can learn to paddle and dive and hunt for themselves. Already the mother-pup relationship has begun to weaken. The mothers are out at sea feeding and will often stay away for upwards of a week before returning to feed their young. The sea lion bulls are fighting further along the beach. A hari mona has had his supremacy challenged by a younger bull and their clumsy bodies threaten to crush the helpless pups. The highest mortality among the young sea lions is caused by fighting bulls. The female sea lions mate again a few days after giving birth and then return to sea, landing at intervals to suckle their young. Sea lions are accustomed to the even temperature of the sea and dislike much variation. Sand flipping is very common. It's thought that the sand helps to protect them from a wind or the hot sun. Their main cooling system is their flippers. Holding them in the air helps to dissipate the heat from their tremendously thick coats of blubber. Fighting in the colony goes on almost continuously. Every suitable part of the beach is occupied and the individual harems are very close together. The territorial boundaries between them are invisible to us, but instantly clear to an established sea lion bull who is quick to attack any young male that has the temerity to trespass on his preserves. The breeding season draws on. Up to now, storms had prevented further filming of the whales, and the Menuhins had been getting anxious. But now comes good weather, and with it a stroke of luck. The breaching of a calf. This means that the mother can't be far away. Why these whales launch themselves out of the water, or breach as it's called, no one knows. It's been suggested that it's done to get rid of parasites, or perhaps it's just playful exuberance. But here at last is a chance for some underwater filming. And while Krov gets ready in the bows, Anne rows the boat into position. Then a fantastic sight as mother and calf come out together. We never used our engines when we were around the whales. We only rowed. We tried to make a meeting between the whales and us as natural as possible, hence the rowing. We didn't know what they were going to do. We were in a way unprepared for their friendliness. We wanted to get into the water with the whales as quickly as possible. Uh, this was our prime reason for, for being there. It was a mother and her calf. And as far as I know, nobody had been successful in filming a calf before because of the mother's protective instincts, which don't necessarily mean that she's going to chase you out of the water, but she keeps her bulk between whatever threatens her calf and the calf itself. 
I must say that for the first 15 or 20 minutes that I was in the water with them, I don't think I was scared as much as just awed. I just had no idea of the size. It's an immense, immense thing. I didn't feel in much danger from the adult. I felt that if there was any danger, it was going to come from the exuberance of the calf. The calf was very curious, would move quite quickly. And if one happened to be in the way while the calf was moving quickly, then they could probably do you a considerable amount of damage. It was just a question of being aware of where the whale was all the time, especially its tail. We began to find out that the whales, all the whales, were extremely gentle. I mean, in particular, the relationship between mother and calf was marvelous to watch. They're constantly together. They do play a lot together. You can see them lying on the surface sleeping or the calf going under to nurse. But all the whales were very gentle. As we worked with them, we realized that they are just curious, very aware of their size and their own strength. They're very graceful, and they would never get in our way. And we had to be careful not to get in their way. I mean, it's a two-way street. I did get knocked in the water, and I was knocked in by the calf. And I think it's because, as with any young animal, they're not as aware of themselves. I didn't feel it was in any way a malicious act or aggressive. They were playing near the boat. They had been near the boat, and he just knocked the boat hard enough that I fell off the bow. But it was very exciting, and after I fell in, I thought, well, I have to get back in again now. Anne is disappointed to miss an opportunity of diving with the whales, but time is getting short. After a long spell of bad weather, the expedition must continue its filming of the other species and has to return to camp to prepare for the next day's work. The whales swim quietly away. Apart from man, their only predator is the 30-foot, 10-ton killer whale, and they've been known to heave one out of the water. But the Menuans are no longer doubtful about the reaction of the whales to them or to the boat. So far, they've treated the boat with great gentleness. In the cormorant colony, the rapidly growing young with insatiable appetites are clamoring for larger and larger meals. At the height of the season, the amount of food brought into the breeding grounds is enormous. The sun-baked ground is hot and dusty, but the patches of bare skin on an adult's head and throat act as a cooling system, while the bird is confined to its nest site in the roasting sun. The parents take it in turns to hunt for food and guard the nest site. The incoming bird takes up guard duties and feeds the young, while its mate flies off to hunt for a fresh supply of food. But first, I'll wash and brush up to clean away the dust and dirt of the crowded colony and to prepare body and feathers for another heavy diving programme. The penguins too change guard and go out to sea each day to wash themselves and hunt for food trotting down to the beach like a column of soldiers from their nesting burrows, which can be up to a mile or so inland.
Beautifully adapted to underwater swimming, their wings have virtually the same muscular movements as in flying. They're wary of an underwater cameraman, though, perhaps because of his similarity to a seal, their natural enemy. The sea lions are well into their breeding season and now spend more time offshore. Their behaviour when they meet a diver is very different from that of the penguin. Well, the interesting point to me was the difference in behaviour between the sea lions on the land and the sea lions in the water. On the land, they don't move very well. Underwater, where they are so graceful, where they can move like a rocket, and uh, where they can utilize all of their sensing, defense, or offense mechanisms, they are much more confident. We could approach within a foot, two feet of them. In fact, they would come right next to us in the water. Whereas on land, I wouldn't get close to a bull. I think it would be suicide to try and get five feet away from a, a sea lion bull. But underwater, they were very, very playful. In the water, a sea lion's body is eight feet of streamlined efficiency. Its breathing rhythm enables it to stay down for long periods. Even on land, it may go for as long as 10 minutes without breathing. We can see a stream of bubbles coming from a sea lion as it expels air. This controls its buoyancy and allows it to lie easily on the bottom. Like this one, sea lions often pick up and swallow stones from the bottom. Up to 25 pounds of stones have been recovered from a sea lion's stomach. The reason for this behaviour is a mystery. The stones may counteract the pangs of hunger, or like a diver's weight belt, they may help an animal to establish a better trim during its underwater swimming. The sea lions were really exquisite underwater, and I'm sure they knew it. They played and showed off. They were very vain. They were marvelous to be with, though. They were so natural. Soon the sea lions will be gone, to feeding grounds no one knows where. The breeding and mating season of the elephant seals finished several weeks ago. Now it's their annual molt. Since the season ended, they've been living offshore to feed and regain their strength. 
But now they've returned to the same beaches they used for breeding. As their skin flakes off, the animals become more and more grotesque. It'll last for about 20 days. Already the young males have started sparring in preparation for a future season. The bouts are playful now, but they'll be fought in earnest during the years to come. The Valdez breeding season is almost over. Now the penguins are leaving the peninsula and fighting their way out through the heavy surf to begin a 2,000 mile journey back to their home waters off Brazil. The penguin burrows are empty. And once again, the breeding grounds that so recently echoed with a million voices assume the likeness of a lunar landscape. The sound and fury of the sea lions and the elephant seals is only a memory. And along the deserted sands, there's only the sound of wind and sea. Surfacing just offshore, the last whale on the breeding grounds, just this one left. one male remained in the area for some unknown reason and the weather just happened to be with us and we went out to look for him. We spent half the day looking for him and finally we stopped the boats and drifted for maybe an hour and he came to us. It was an incredible experience because he was the last whale. We all knew it would be the last chance to share this relationship. I think he was more curious than any of the whales we'd worked with. He'd constantly circle around and come back in, and you could see the white spots on his head approaching you. The southern right whale's habit of mating and carving in these sheltered inland waters has always made them extremely vulnerable. They were rare animals even before mechanized whaling began. Today, very few are left. The single animal remaining on the breeding grounds will be the expedition's last chance of filming the close-up shots they've been hoping to get. These white patches on the head, nose and chin are distinctive points by which this species can be recognized. They're callus-like growths that the animal is born with. And the old whale hunters called the top ones the bonnet. These callocytes become impacted with tiny crab-like creatures called whale lice. And if they have any particular function, no one knows what it is. There are two blowholes that close automatically when water comes over them. When surfacing, a whale can empty and refill its lungs in only two seconds. The callocyte bonnet and the distinctive V-shaped blow meant much to the early whalers. Here was a prey slow enough to catch, fat enough to float after the kill, and when the demand for whalebone was high, carried a fortune in its jaws. Enough in the 17th century to pay twice over the expenses of a whaling expedition. A single carcass can produce 4,000 gallons of oil. Small wonder that as early as the 12th century, the species was called the right whale, because it was the right whale to kill. The mouth, when open, can swallow up to two tons of shrimp-like krill, its staple diet. Like the other big plankton feeders, it traps the krill within its great strainer-like curtains of whalebone. Then, pressing its tongue against the roof of its mouth, it forces the water out and leaves the krill dry to swallow. As Krav Menuhin swims slowly around its head, the whale remains stationary. 
staring unmoved as the camera passes within a foot of its cow-like eye. These chin whiskers are the only hairs on its body, vestigial evidence of a small dog-like ancestor that lived on land over 60 million years ago. I had been very disappointed that I hadn't had a good swim with the whales. And when we found this last one, I, I was just so anxious to get in the water. I thought, well, if I spend 15 minutes putting on my wetsuit, the whale will probably have left, and it would be just my luck. I never would have gotten in with him. It's a difficult experience to really put into words. The size is a feeling that you really can't duplicate, the size of seeing this whale underwater. He was very gentle, as were all the whales, very calm. I'm sure I was far more excited than he was about the whole situation. The water was cold, but I was so involved with being with this whale, I didn't even feel it. I was at fault in the one instance when I swam down and, and did get in front of his tail, which I didn't realize I was doing. And he started forward, and all of a sudden I was off. It was quite an experience. He didn't even knock the wind out of me, which amazes me. This enormous tail, you would think maybe I'd have a couple of broken ribs or something. But it was a great strength, but very gentle. When it all ends, that one cannot help but feel a sense of emptiness and, and loneliness oneself. It's a momentary emptiness of actually seeing them go and seeing it end. It all seemed to happen so quickly, we felt we'd just really gotten involved in it. Leaves one virtually empty, exhausted, I think, after this incredible experience. <laughs> 